Back in the early 1800s, there was a young boy in New Jersey. The boy had been born into a family of high standing in the still young United States. His grandpa was even one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. And his dad was a senator. Because of this, this boy had access to the best education money could buy. He even got into Princeton University at the ripe old age of 13. It helped that his great-great-grandpa was one of its founders, too. He was raised to be an elite, to learn law, and then go on to be an attorney, then judge, and possibly getting to politics like the rest of his family. But he began to read about a man named Lord Admiral Horatio Nelson, who had died back in 1805. Admiral Nelson um, was an inspirational figure, a hero, a martyr for the United States, someone this young man would strive to emulate for the rest of his life. Within a couple of years, this young man would soon leave Princeton and begin studying at his uncle's naval academy. Then his time came, February 1812, to go to war. He was 17 years old. By June of that year, he was on ship as a midshipman under a Commodore Rogers. The ship was chasing after a British one and began to fire on it. But disaster struck when one of the bow chasers, which is a type of cannon, blew up. The result of that was two dead and 14 wounded, including Commodore Rogers and a young midshipman, which you may have heard of, Matthew Perry. This caused the ship to fall back and let the British ship get away. This young man showed himself to be strong and willing and calm in the midst of intense battle, which gave him the nickname Fighting Bob. In this episode of Ricky's Historical Tidbits, I will share with you the incredible life of this Fighting Bob, known mostly by his real name, Robert F. Stockton. This is Ricky's Historical Tidbits Podcast, and this is Ricky Mortensen. After the War of 1812, Stockton had moved up to First Lieutenant, very much a fighter, as his nickname would suggest. He continued in the Navy in the war against the Barbary States, and during that, he would find himself in duels with British soldiers who insulted the United States. Soon, Stockton would find himself in control of his own ship and would begin patrolling the waters around West Africa to capture slave ships. The United States banned the importing of new slaves back in 1807, but it was still a problem. Often, Americans smuggling new slaves would portray themselves as merchant ships, and out at sea would even fly the French flag since the French were still participating in the slave trade. Stockton's orders were to capture American slave ships, but he often captured any slave ship that he saw and called them pirates in order to legally capture them. Sometimes he would even fly a French flag himself in order to get closer to these slave ships. Around this time, he was also asked to find a place in Africa to relocate the freed slaves back in the States. In case you didn't know, the United States at its founding wanted to ban slavery outright, but two or three of the 13 states said no. So for the sake of unity, slavery was kept, but the idea was to eventually get rid of slavery. Eventually. Often slaves would be freed at the death of their owner. So there was more and more freed slaves in the United States, but they were not American. They often didn't want to be either. But they couldn't go back to their home in Africa because the slave trade was run by Africans. Smaller, weaker tribes would be captured by bigger, stronger tribes and then sold out around the world so it would be foolish and unsafe for them to return to their real homes. Africa is a huge continent. It's not a country. It was not all happy-dappy, slappy-pappy puppies and rainbows like some people would like you to think which is why a group called the American Colonization Society was founded. One of its founders, by the way, was Francis Scott Key, you know, the guy who wrote the Star Spangled Banner. It was also very much supported by the South for their own reasons, and the North for their own reasons. 
Their goal was to find a good place in Africa where they could set up a colony for these freed slaves and help them to adapt back into the land and be kept safe from the other African tribes who may want to capture and enslave or simply kill them. So in 1920, this group brought 91 freed slaves to West Africa, but the people there said no. So they jumped from place to place until they were welcomed, which was a place called Sherbo Island. But it didn't work out too well because their immune systems have kind of evolved to the point where they no longer could withstand African diseases, and about a quarter of those freed slaves died from yellow fever. Other trips to West Africa also proved deadly from disease for both the Americans bringing them there and the freed slaves themselves. Stockton, at this point, joined in the search in 1821, arriving at Sierra Leone and met with the governor there, who told him the best place to go was south a few hundred miles, but there was also a huge problem there. The native tribes that lived there were known for being extremely brutal and non-negotiable with the strangers. Many have tried to buy land from, uh, from them, and many have failed. Stockton was up to the challenge and went down to Cape Mezzorado and began to meet with the kings and leaders in the area. The top man to convince was a man named King Peter. Stockton was able to befriend King Peter and was able to convince him of the benefits of allowing a colony of freed slaves to be in his land. Better trade, new arts, new agricultural methods, and so on. Stockton was successful and a deal was made. But a problem came when it was time to sign the deal. King Peter and all the tribesmen were missing. Stockton set out on a search, going 20 miles into the jungle, where he finally found them, but they were no longer friendly. About 500 men surrounded him, armed with knives and swords. It turned out that a mulatto, which is a half-white, half-black man who was part of the slave trade, convinced King Peter that Stockton had ulterior motives and was anti-slave trade, which he was. King Peter was part of the slave trade, capturing other tribes and selling them off and taking their land. Stockton realized what was happening and yelled out, Silence! Pulled out a pistol, cocked it, and gave it to the man next to him. Pointed at the mulatto and saying to shoot that guy dead if he opened his mouth. Then pulled out another pistol, cocked it, and pointed it right at King Peter's head and asked to be heard. He then began defending himself and his motives and explaining again that a colony would be really good for them. And then he lowered his pistol and said if they still don't want to make a deal, they can kill him and all his men right now, but God would punish them for it. At this moment, when he said this, the sun peeked out from behind the clouds, shining right on Stockton. And that was all the convincing that they needed. The deal was signed. The land was given by tribe kings Peter, George, Yoda, and Long Peter. The land was mostly coastal and went on to become the Republic of Liberia, whose flag looks very similar to the Texas flag and the American flag. There are 11 stripes, which symbolizes the signatories of the Liberian Declaration of Independence, and the colors white and red symbolize courage and moral excellence. The white star is because Liberia was the first independent republic of Africa, and the blue square is Africa. After all this, he went back to Africa, capturing slave ships as he went. He got to America essentially broke and 38 years old. He was very low paid and owned no land, no businesses, and without orders from the Navy, he was kind of lost at this stage of his life. Luckily for him, though, he married a young lady from South Carolina whose dad was a big business and plantation owner. And he had lots of investments and even ran for president twice. Stockton started his own newspaper called the New Jersey Patriot, got into politics a little, and even got into a fist fight over his honor in the middle of a democratic convention. He became a plantation owner himself, having a little over 100 slaves to operate it, which is kind of interesting because of the work he did for the Republic of Liberia. 
But anyways, he continued his business life into the railroad and canal industry and did really well in that, kind of having a monopoly of sorts, and his business life was not without some fighting, but let's fast forward to 1840s. At this point in time, Stockton got back into the Navy, though he technically never left. And one of his first things that he did was lobby for new steamships to be built, since England and France seemed to have better ships, which was a national security threat. He got it, and soon a ship named the USS Princeton was born. Once it was built, there was the inaugural cruise down the Potomac River. Potomac? 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 Potomac. It sounds like a song. Potomac River and lots of high-ranking people came aboard, and they cruised down, and they fired the cannon two times, which also was top of the line. Then they wanted to fire again as they passed Mount Vernon as a salute to George Washington. By this time, the majority of the people on board had gone down into the ship for lunch. And for whatever reason, when Stockton pulled the string to fire, it exploded and hot metal was blasted all over the place. A few people died, including the Secretary of State, the Secretary of the Navy, President Tyler's father-in-law. Stockton himself had a piece of iron fly through his leg and his hair was all burnt off. He was taken to court over all this, but he was cleared of all wrongdoing. Now, let's get to the California part. Stockton was sent to Texas to check out the situation there. Texas, at this point, was its own country, with most wanting to annex into the United States, but still having issues with Mexico. It was kind of a big mess, basically. Stockton was sent there kind of undercover to observe everything going on in Texas. But he blew his cover and told the president of Texas that President Polk of the United States wanted Texas to be extra hostile to Mexico so that when Texas became a state, it would bring the United States into a war with Mexico, which was likely a win since Mexico had a vastly inferior military, and a win would give the United States the ability to expand further into the West. Stockton wasn't supposed to say that. But it worked nonetheless. Fast forward just a little bit, Stockton was told to bring some people to the Sandwich Islands, which is Hawaii. After that, he docked in Monterey in California. At this time, the Bear Flag Revolt came and went, and Commodore Sloat had declared California for the United States. I tell you a little, little bit about this in my episode about William Leidesdorf. President Polk was afraid that an independent California would easily be taken over by England, so it was important to quickly call dibs. Which, by the way, records show that British ships came just days after Sloat declared California for the United States, saw an American flag, and decided it wasn't worth fighting for. Stockton had no orders to go to California, but he took the opportunity to tell Commodore Sloat that he was there. It turned out that Sloat was waiting for a replacement so he can go back home. And without double-checking, he gave his post to Stockton. This made Stockton commander-in-chief of the territory of California. A happy accident that Stockton took and ran with. Immediately, Stockton put out a proclamation accusing Mexico of being hostile to the United States and essentially declared war with Mexico. There's a lot more to the story, but basically there are three general forces in California for the United States. Stockton having the strongest, and then General Kearney and General Fremont having about equal but smaller uh, forces. Stockton started for Los Angeles to fight General Castro's army, but Castro retreated to Sonora, which is the part of modern-day Mexico that is south of Tucson, Arizona. Claiming victory... Stockton wrote to President Polk, telling him that he was not in Honolulu like he was supposed to be, but he was actively taking over California and would probably be done with it a few months. Then he said that once he had conquered entirely, he would hand the torch to someone else and go back to sailing the sea. After that, Stockton put out another proclamation announcing martial law until California was completely under the United States' control. Not long after this, General Kearney and Gillespie in San Diego was not having as good of luck as Stockton, and so Stockton had to make his way down there to fight off the Mexican army, and he won. Eventually, they signed the Treaty of Coenja. Coen? Coenga. I think I said that right. 
There was quite a bit of infighting among Stockton and the generals over who was in charge after the war, but it came to an end when a superior of Stockton arrived, Captain Shubrick, who then was outranked by Captain Biddle, who came not long after that. And Stockton was reduced to nothing, essentially, and was told to just go back home. Before going home, though, Stockton bought some land over by Santa Clara, which became a really good investment because of the gold rush a few years later. Stockton had a mining operation back in his hometown area of New Jersey, but when the gold rush came, he sent his best workers and ton, uh, tons of the machinery to get a head start on the gold. He also made an orchard and buildings that were recreations of the homes he'd had back in Princeton, New Jersey. During this time, he was a senator for New Jersey. He sold it all after his wife died in 1862 and made a very nice profit of almost $2.5 million in that time's money. As a senator, Stockton advocated for taking the rest of Mexico as well, but the lack of Americans living there kept the All of Mexico movement from happening, as the values of Mexicans didn't really equal American values. Stockton also advocated for the banning of flogging as punishment uh, in the Navy, which did pass. During the Civil War, Stockton refused to fight. He was a, in his upper 60s, but he was also against the War of Northern Aggression. Robert Stockton is one of those people in history that you either hate him or you love him. He was a fighting man. He did great things, but also didn't follow orders all too well. He got himself into more trouble than he got rewarded. And he spoke his mind whether it was unpopular or not. He's one of those men in history that, in our modern time, would judge for his methods and, without a deep look, would simply disavow. He did great things in the War of 1812. Captured pirates and slave ships. He led the creation of the Republic of Liberia for the freed slaves, almost single-handedly conquered California, and ended the practice of flogging in the Navy. But he also ignored orders, made decisions above his pay grade, owned plenty of slaves himself, and was a Democrat from New Jersey who was pro-Union but also pro-slavery. A really good book I read researching Stockton called Robert F. Stockton, Protean Man for a Protean Nation, uh, by R. John Brockman, puts it very well, and I'll just leave you with this quote from the end of that book. Regal, overrated, captain of men, friend and benefactor, bellicose firebrand, Robert Stockton was many things to many people. But in two things, he was constant. He was unwavering in his dedication to his state and to his country. And he never failed to strive for glory. Regardless of what history makes of his achievements, and there are inarguably many, and of his mistakes and blunders, which there were also numerous, he ought always to be remembered as a man of position and principle, ever ready to throw down the gauntlet in the passionate defense of what he Believe.